All right, we are going to begin reading chapter one of To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. So what I've done here is that Google happened to have a PDF of To Kill a Mockingbird, so I'm going to put it up on the screen. I usually find it easier to read out of a paper copy, but for our purposes today, I'm going to have one up on the screen as well. So if you have access to a paper copy, that might be an easier way to follow along. In addition to that, I also have my To Kill a Mockingbird chapter notes here. Uh, and remember, in the intro video, we talked about doing this a little bit. I've added a section here for questions as well, because it's important to be able to ask questions while you're reading. As Tara Bray Smith said, the ability to read involves reading with a pen in hand, so you can discuss the novel with the author, even if you don't get an answer. But in this case, we'll do our best to answer as we go through. So we want to make sure that we have this up. And I, I want to be clear that you shouldn't just rely on what you hear here to help fill in these blanks. Make sure that you're adding your own as well. That's the entire purpose of this, is so that we can have that discussion with each other or with your teacher, or whoever it is that you are reading this with. So with that in mind, let's jump back to To Kill a Mockingbird. And we're going to scroll down here to chapter one. I'm not a voice actor, obviously, but I'll do my best. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed and Jim's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. So right away, we're going to pause because we have a couple things that we want to check out. So first of all, we're going to look up the word assuage. Make sure we know what that means because that's a good vocab word. Assuage, to make an unpleasant feeling less intense or to satisfy. His feelings that he would never be able to play football again were satisfied, they were calm. So we're going to first go here, we're going to add that in. And here, we're also going to come add something in. So we are going to add in bullet points on this one. Now, not to give away too much, but this story, this bit about Jim's arm getting broken, it's going to come up again in the story. But by the time it comes up, you're likely going to forget that the story began this way. So we're going to include that in there just as a reminder for when we get there. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right. When he stood or walked, the back of his hand was at right angles to his body, his thumb parallel to his thigh. He couldn't have cared so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the event leading to the accident. I maintain that the evil started it all, but Jim, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us, when Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. All right, let's jump back because we've gotten a whole bunch of notes here all jammed into one. So when we talk about the plot diagram, so this would be our exposition. Okay, so we have Dill, Jim, the, shouldn't be capitalized, the Yules, and Boo Bradley. Now we don't know who any of these people are except that Jim is her brother. We have a lot of stuff jammed in here. Fact, we'll come here and add that in. So we'll do exposition. We have our character introduction and incident involving Jim and Fuels. Let's jump back. I said if he wanted to take a broad view of the thing, it really began with Andrew Jackson. If General Jackson hadn't run the creeks up the creek, Simon Finch would never have paddled up the Alabama. And where would we be if he hadn't? So if you are unfamiliar with the historical reference here, this is a, a reference to Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears, which is not exactly America's finest moment. We were far too old to settle an argument with a fistfight, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. Ah, another note. We want to add this in here. So. 
Atticus equals father. Okay, so we want to make sure that we have that down as well. Being Southerners, it was a source of shame on some members of the family that we had no recorded ancestors on either side of the Battle of Hastings. All we had was Simon Finch, a fur-trapping apothecary from Cornwall, whose piety was exceeded only by his stinginess. All right, we've got a lot of vocabulary words here, but let's just focus on one. Let's focus on piety. You know, the quality of being religious or reverent. So if you would like to, you can also add in those other vocabulary words, apothecary and the like. Let's just add in piety. In England, Simon was irritated by the persecution of those who called themselves Methodists at the hands of their more liberal brethren. And as Simon called himself a Methodist, he worked his way across the Atlantic to Philadelphia, thence to Jamaica, thence to Mobile, and up to St. Stephen's. Mindful of John Wesley's strictures on the use of many words in buying and selling, Simon made a pile practicing medicine, but in this pursuit he was unhappy, lest he be tempted into doing what he knew was not for the glory of God as the putting on of gold and costly apparel. So we have a reference here. As I said, there's going to be a lot of those, especially pretty early on. But that's all right. That's just a lot of information that we can learn. So let's look up who John Wesley was. So John Wesley, a theologian and evangelist who was a leader of revival movements within the Church of England, known as Methodism. The societies he founded became the dominant form of the independent Methodist movement that continues the, to today. All right, so he was a revivalist, a Methodist, which means that he likely was a very strict evangelical in regards to Bible. And thus, we have his reference here to putting on of gold and costly apparel. As mentioned in the Bible, you're not supposed to ornament yourself uh, expensively. Blessed be the poor, they say. So let's add that in. In fact, that should be here under notes. Continue on. So Simon, having forgotten his teacher's dictum on the possession of human chattels, bought three slaves and with their aid established a homestead on the banks of the Alabama River, some 40 miles above St. Stephen's. Okay, I promise I'm not going to jump out, jump and add in vocabulary and notes every single sentence. There's just a lot at the beginning. So that's another vocab word we want to look up because it does come up a few times in this. Dictum. So, a formal pronouncement from an authoritative source. So if John Wesley said you're not supposed to own slaves, you're not supposed to own slaves. That's the rule. And so we're going to add that one in here under vocabulary. Here we go. He returned to St. Stephen's only once to find a wife. And with her established a line that ran high to daughters. Simon lived to an impressive age and died rich. It was customary for the men in the family to remain on Simon's homestead, Finch's Landing, and make their living from cotton. The place was self-sufficient, modest in comparison with the empires around it. The landing nevertheless produced everything required to sustain life except ice, wheat flour, and articles of clothing supplied by riverboats from Mobile. So this uh, little bit of information that we have here about Finch's Landing, this is going to be important later in the story, because as we find out, part of Scout's family still lives in Finch's Landing, and they have concerns about the way that Scout's family lives and how it's different than theirs. So here we have this idea of the gentry, the fine old family that you can trace back for generations, and they're proud, and they were self-sufficient, and they were independent, and they're much different than those city slickers. Let's add that in under our notes. Let's just say inches landing. I can spell. We'll add in it's the old home of the Finch family. So this will be bumped over to our key events when it actually comes up in the book. But for now, we just want to remember. So that way, when we get down there, we're not too confused as to what they're talking about. 
Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and the South, as it left his descendants stripped of everything but their land. Okay, so what would be that disturbance between the North and the South? If we think of our American history, this one might be kind of obvious. Well, that would be the Civil War. Or if you're from the South, you might even refer to it as the War Between the States. Or if you're really old-timey, the War of Northern Aggression. Yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the 20th century when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister, Alexandra, was the Finch who remained at the landing. She married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trot lines were full. All right, another great vocab word. I'm only going to break this one because we have a couple of notes we want to add in about Scout's family. So let's look up taciturn. Have it right here. Person reserved or uncommunicative in speech, saying little. So a quiet man or a quiet person. Okay, so let's add this here under our vocabulary. Now we're getting quite the uh, list here. That's okay. Add this under key events because it is very important to the story. Atticus is a lawyer. When my father was admitted to the bar, he returned to Maycomb and began his practice. Maycomb, some 20 miles east of Finch's Landing, was the county seat of Maycomb County. Atticus's office in the courthouse contained little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, a checkerboard, and an unsullied code of Alabama. His first two clients were the last two persons hanged in the Macon County Jail. So if his first two clients were the last people hanged, probably doesn't say much about the start he had as a lawyer. Although sometimes as a lawyer, he get just bad clients. Atticus had urged them to accept the state's generosity in allowing them to plead guilty to second-degree murder and escape with their lives. But they were Haverfords in Macon County and named synonymous with jackass. So I particularly like this line because if you follow pop culture at all, if you've ever seen the show Parks and Rec, there's a character on there named Tom Haverford who kind of shares these characteristics with these characters. Now, I don't know for sure that, the, um, that, that there's a direct tie between the two and that the creators of Parks and Rec, Greg Daniels, took this idea, took this name from this book, but it is a pretty strong coincidence. The Haverfords had dispatched Maycomb's leading blacksmith in a misunderstanding arising from the alleged wrongful detention of a mayor, or imprudent enough to do it in the presence of three witnesses, and insisted that the son of a bitch had it coming to him was a good enough defense for anybody. So if you didn't follow that, uh, they, they blamed a blacksmith for stealing their horse, and so they killed the blacksmith in front of witnesses and said that he deserved it. Probably not great clients to have if you're a lawyer. They persisted in pleading not guilty to first-degree murder, so there was nothing much Atticus could do for his clients except be present at their departure, an occasion that was probably the beginning of my father's profoundest taste for the practice of criminal law. During his first five years in Maycomb, Atticus practiced economy more than anything. For several years thereafter, he invested his earnings in his brother's education. John Hale Finch was 10 years younger than my father and chose to study medicine at a time when cotton was not worth growing. But after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked Maycomb. He was Maycomb County born and bred. He knew his people, they knew him, and because of Simon Finch's industry, Atticus was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. So if you've ever been to a small town, I taught in small towns for my first four years as a teacher, this is pretty standard. Um, they, there's a lot of jokes about everybody having the same last name. That's not an untrue reference. Macon was an old town, but it was a tired old town when I first knew it. In rainy weather, the streets turned to red slop, grass grew on the sidewalks, the courthouse sagged in the summer. Somehow, it was hotter then. A black dog suffered on a summer's day. Bony mules hitched to hoover carts flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks of the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon, after their three o'clock naps, and by nightfall were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. So very similar to that imagery we get of movies like Gone with the Wind. You have here the South where it's so hot and everything's lazy and nobody wants to do anything. 
And especially at the time, you uh, viewed yourself, uh, especially if you were white, as kind of the Scarlett O'Hara character who was just sitting there fanning herself and smusing about life. But of course, as we go through the uh, story here, we're going to see that facade, that image that they have of themselves kind of crack. People move slowly then. They ambled across the square, shuffled in and out of the stores around it, and took their time about everything. A day was 24 hours long, but seemed longer. There was no hurry, for if there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy, and no money to buy it with. Nothing to see outside the boundaries of Macomb County, but it was a time of vague optimism for some people. Macomb County had recently been told that it had nothing to fear but fear itself. Nothing to fear but fear itself. That is actually a very important clue. Because not only is this an extremely famous quote, but we can actually find out when it was said and who said it, if you don't already know. And that will tell us exactly when this takes place. Here we go. So let's type this in. This gives us a phrase from the 1933 inaugural address of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Nothing to fear but fear itself. All right, so this is around 1933. Okay, so we're going to add this into our key events setting. Make them year, let's say 1934. Okay, so we know it's a little bit after this. And we also know that something happened in 1934. Let's jump up here. So if we check here, the Great Depression ended just before the setting of this book. Okay, so it ended just before 1933. So that's not to say that the Great Depression wasn't still going on or the effects of the Great Depression weren't still being felt, but we're in kind of the economic recovery period of the Great Depression. So everybody in this is poor. Um, most of them have lost their life savings or their careers or their jobs. We also have the Dust Bowl that just recently happened. So they're starting to come back. They've got a little hope coming back, as Scout mentioned, but they're also still probably pretty wary about what's happening. So that also explains here, there was nothing to buy and no money to buy it with. We lived on the main residential street in town. Atticus, Jim, and I, plus Calpurnia, our cook, Jim and I found our father satisfactory. He played with us, read to us, and treated us with courteous detachment. Calpurnia was something else again. She was all angles and bones. She was nearsighted, she squinted. Her hand was white as a bed slat and twice as hard. She was always ordering me out of the kitchen, asking me why I couldn't behave as well as Jim when she knew he was older, calling me home when I wasn't ready to come. Our battles were epic and one-sided. Calpurnia always won, mainly because Atticus always took her side. She had been with us ever since Jim was born, and I had felt her tyrannical presence as long as I could remember. Okay, Calpurnia is going to be an extremely important character throughout the course of this story. So we're going to add her in. We're actually going to add here, her here under the key events. So Calpurnia, um, a lot of my students, when we first start reading, think that she's uh, Scout's mother or perhaps Atticus's girlfriend. No, she's actually a housekeeper and the cook, but she is also African- American. And that's going to be very, very important because she is going to be part of Scout's window into the idea that not everybody lives the same way that Scout does. Our mother died when I was two, so I never felt her absence. There we go. So there's the answer to that question. You can add that into your notes if you would like. She was a Graham from Montgomery. Atticus met her when he was first elected to the state legislature. He was middle-aged then. She was 15 years his junior. Jim was the product of their first marriage. Four years later, I was born, and two years later, our mother died from a sudden heart attack. They said it ran in her family. I did not miss her, but I think Jim did. He remembered her clearly, and sometimes in the middle of a game, he would sigh at length and go off and play by himself behind the car house. Uh, the car house, uh, I'm not sure if they still call it that in the South. If you're in the Midwest, you probably know it as a garage. When he was like that, I knew better than to bother him. When I was almost six and Jim was nearly ten, our summertime boundaries within calling distance of Calpurnia, or Miss Henry Lafayette Dubose's house, 
and two doors north of us, and the Radley Place three doors to the south. So we have the Radley Place. We've already caught that name, Boo Radley. We were never tempted to break them. The Radley Place was inhabited by an unknown entity, the mere description of whom was enough to make us behave for days on end. Mr. Bose was plain hell. That was the summer Dill came to us. So here we're starting to fill in who these people she mentioned at the beginning of the story are. Early one morning, as we were beginning our day's play in the backyard, Jim and I heard something next door in Miss Rachel Haverford's collard patch. We went to the wire house to see if, it, if there was a puppy. Miss Rachel's rat terrier was expecting. Instead, we found somebody sitting looking at us. Sitting down, he wasn't much higher than the collards. We stared at him until he spoke. Hey. Hey, yourself, said Jim pleasantly. Well, I'm Charles Baker Harris, he said. I can read. So what, I said. I just thought you'd like to know I can read. You got anything needs reading, I can do it. How old are you? Asked Jim. Four and a half. Going on seven. Shoot, no wonder then, said Jim, jerking his thumb at me. Scout yonder's been reading ever since she was born, and she ain't even started to school yet. You look right puny for going on seven. Well, I'm little, but I'm old, he said. Jim brushed his hair back to get a better look. Why don't you come over, Charles Baker Harris, he said. Lord, what a name. It's not any funnier than yours. Aunt Rachel says your name's Jeremy Atticus Finch. Jim scowled. I'm big enough to fit mine, he said. Your name's longer than you are. Bet it's a foot longer. Well, folks call me Dill, said Dill, struggling under the fence. Do better if you go over it instead of under it, I said. Where'd you come from? Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi. He was spending the summer with his aunt, Miss Rachel, and would be spending every summer in Macomb from now on. His family was from Macomb County originally. His mother worked for a photographer in Meridian and entered his picture in a beautiful child contest and won $5. She gave the money to Dill, who went to the picture show 20 times on it. Boy, can you imagine being able to go to the movies 20 times with $5? Or honestly, right now, can you imagine going to the movies at all? Don't have any picture shows here, except Jesus ones in the courthouse sometimes, said Jim. Ever see anything good? Dill had seen Dracula, a revelation that moved Jim to eye him with a beginning of respect. Tell it to us, he said. Dill was a curiosity. He wore blue linen shorts that buttoned to his shirt. His hair was snow white and stuck to his head like duck fluff. He was a year my senior, but I towered over him. As he told us the old tale, his blue eyes would lighten and darken. His laugh was sudden and happy. He habitually pulled at a cowlick in the center of his forehead. When Dill reduced Dracula to dust and Jim said the show sounded better than the book, I asked Dill where his father was. You ain't said anything about him. Well, I haven't got one. Is he dead? No. Well, then if he's not dead, you've got one, haven't you? Dill blushed, and Jim told me to hush, a sure sign that Dill had been studied and found acceptable. Thereafter, the summer passed in routine contentment. Routine contentment was in improving our treehouse that rested between the giant twin chinaberry trees in the backyard, fussing, running through our list of dramas based on the works of Oliver Optic, Victor Appleton, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. So if you're not familiar with these, these uh, are all authors that wrote adventure stories. Edgar Rice Burroughs is particularly still famous because he wrote some of the Tarzan books. In this matter, we were lucky to have Dill. He played the character parts formerly thrust upon me. The ape and Tarzan, Mr. Crabtree and the Rover Boys, Mr. Damon and Tom Swift. Thus, he came to know Dill as a pocket Merlin, whose head teemed with eccentric plans, strange longings, and quaint fancies. So we're going to go ahead and jump back. Let's add this to our key events so we know who Dill is a little bit. And the important part that we want to know is that he's full of ideas, stories, loves, adventure. A lot of the events that are uh, taking place in this story are set into place by Dill and because of his love of stories and adventure. By the end of August, our repertoire was vapid from countless reproductions. And it was then that Dill gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. All right, let's check out that word. Vapid. I like this one. Offering nothing that is stimulating or challenging. So, somebody who is boring. So let's add this in.
The Radley place fascinated Dill. In spite of our warnings and explanations, it drew him as the moon draws water, but drew him no nearer than the light pole on the corner, a safe distance from the Radley gate. There he would stand, his arm around the fat pole, staring and wondering. The Radley place jutted into a sharp curve beyond our house. Walking south, one faced its porch. The sidewalk turned and ran beside the lot. The house was low and once white with a deep front porch and green shutters, but had long ago darkened to the color of the slate gray yard around it. Rain rotted shingles drooped over the eaves of the veranda. Oak trees kept the sun away. The remains of a picket drunkenly guarded the front yard, a swept yard that was never swept, where Johnson grass and rabbit tobacco grew in abundance. So what I want to do really quick, sometimes people are visual learners and just taking notes isn't enough for them. They want something to help remind them about what it is that they've read. So one of the things that I want to do real quick is I'm going to look up haunted house and I'm going to go to images. I'm going to see if I can find a house that I think does a good representation of showing me what I imagine the Radley house would look like. So I'm going to scroll down. I see something like this as being a good example of a haunted house. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy it and I'm going to paste it here under my chapter notes before I get to chapter two. So I'm going to add it here and I'll mark it. Yes. Okay. So that's going to help me remember exactly what it is that I'm looking at. Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. People said he existed, but Jim and I had never seen him. People said he went out at night when the moon was down and peeped in windows. When people's azaleas froze in a cold snap, it was because he had breathed on them. Any stealthy small crimes committed in Maycomb were his work. Once the town was terrorized by a series of morbid nocturnal events, people's chickens and household pets were found mutilated. Although the culprit was Crazy Addy, who eventually drowned himself in Barker's Eddy. People still looked at the Radley Place, unwilling to discard their initial suspicions. A Negro would not pass the Radley Place at night. He would cut across the sidewalk opposite and whistle as he walked. The Maycomb School grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot. From the Radley chicken yard, tall pecan trees shook their fruit into the schoolyard, but the nuts lay untouched by the children. Radley pecans would kill you. A baseball hit into the Radley yard was a lost ball and no questions asked. The misery of that house began many years before Jim and I were born. The Radleys welcome anywhere in town kept to themselves, a predilection unforgivable in Maycomb. They did not go to church, Maycomb's principal recreation, but worshipped at home. Miss Radley seldom, if ever, crossed the street for a mid-morning coffee break with her neighbors, and certainly never joined a missionary circle. Mr. Radley walked to town at 11.30 every morning and came back promptly at 12, sometimes carrying a brown paper bag that the neighborhood assumed contained the family groceries. I never knew how old Mr. Radley made his living. Jim said he bought cotton, a polite term for doing nothing. But Mr. Radley and his wife had lived there with their two sons as long as anybody could remember. Okay, so let's jump back here. Our key events, let's add in. Radley family. Reclusive. Evil? Let's add that in as a question. And here, let's add in our question here. What happened to the Radley family? Okay, maybe that's a question we'll get answered through the course of this book. The shutters and doors of the Radley house were closed on Sundays. Another thing alien to make up his way is closed doors meant illness and cold weather only. Of all days, Sunday was the day for formal afternoon visiting. Ladies wore corsets, men wore coats, and children wore shoes. They climbed the Radley front steps and call, hey, of a Sunday afternoon was something their neighbors never did. The Radley house had no screen doors. I once asked Atticus if they ever had any. Atticus said yes, but before I was born. According to neighborhood legend, when the younger Radley boy was in his teens, he became acquainted with some of the Cunninghams from Old Sarum an enormous and confusing tribe domiciled in the northern part of the county, and they formed the nearest thing to a gang ever seen in Maycomb. They did little, but enough to be discussed by the town, 
and publicly warned from three pulpits. They hung around the barber shop. They rode the bus to Abbotsville on Sundays and went to the picture show. They intended dances at the county's Riverside Gambling Hall, the Dew Drop Inn, and Fishing Camp. They experimented with stump hole whiskey. Nobody in Maycomb had nerve enough to tell Mr. Radley that his boy was in with the wrong crowd. So I love that idea. If you're in a small town, that, that's your gang, is that they hang around the barber shop and they uh, go to dances at a gambling hall. One night, in an excessive spurt of high spirits, the boys backed around the square in a borrowed flivver, resisting arrest by Maycomb's ancient beetle, Mr. Connor, and locked him in the courthouse outhouse. So there's another word that we might not be familiar. It's mostly an anglism, so we don't use it here in America as well. So it, but let's find out. So a beetle, a ceremonial officer of a church, college, or similar institution. So let's add that into our vocabulary words. Officer of the church. So not quite a deputy because he only works for the church, but still likes to act like he is one. The town decided something had to be done. Mr. Connor said he knew who each and every one of them was, and he was bound and determined they wouldn't get away with it. So the boys came before the probate judge on charges of disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, assault and battery, and using abusive and profane language in the presence and hearing of a female. The judge asked Mr. Connor why he included the last charge. Mr. Connor said that they cussed so loud he was sure every lady in Maycomb heard them. The judge decided to send the boys to the state industrial school where boys were sometimes sent for no other reason than to provide them with food and decent shelter. It was no prison, and it was no disgrace. Mr. Radley thought it was. If the judge released Arthur, Mr. Radley would see to it that Arthur gave no further trouble. Knowing that Mr. Radley's word was his bond, the judge was glad to do so. So here we are. This kind of feeds into that image of, of Boo Radley, uh, who is Arthur. In fact, let's mark that down. So he's, his, his real name is Arthur, and he's a criminal. Mm. Criminal? At least he was. So that might explain what happened to him at the beginning, but not why he's so locked up now. The other boys attended the industrial school and received the best secondary education to be had in the state. One of them eventually worked his way through engineering school at Auburn. The doors of the Radley house were closed on weekdays as well as Sundays, and Mr. Radley's boy was not seen again for 15 years. But there came a day, barely within Jim's memory, when Boo Radley was heard from and was seen by several people, but not by Jim. He said Atticus never talked much about the Radleys. When Jim would question him, Atticus's only answer was for him to mind his own business and let the Radleys mind theirs. They had a right to, but when it happened, Jim said Atticus shook his head and said, mm-mm-mm. -mm -mm. So Jim received most of his information from Miss Stephanie Crawford, a neighborhood scold who said she knew the whole thing. According to Miss Stephanie, Boo was sitting in his living room, cutting up some items from the Maycomb Tribune to paste in his scrapbook. His father entered the room. As Mr. Radley passed by, Boo drove the scissors into his parents' leg, pulled them out, wiped them on his pants, and resumed his activities. Mrs. Radley ran screaming into the streets that Arthur was killing them all, but when the sheriff arrived, he found Boo sitting in the living room, cutting up the Tribune. He was 33 years old then. Miss Stephanie said old Mr. Radley said no Radley was going to an asylum when it was suggested that a season in Tuscaloosa might be helpful to Boo. Boo wasn't crazy. He was high strung at times. It was all right to shut him up, Mr. Radley conceded, but insisted that Boo not be charged with anything. He was not a criminal. The sheriff hadn't the heart to put him in jail alongside the Negroes, so Boo was locked in the courthouse basement. Okay, so there's kind of a throwaway line that also is kind of important, especially with later in the book. We have our first idea that the justice system in this town isn't equal. So Boo, being a, a, a white guy from a fine old family, he doesn't go, he doesn't receive the same justice that a black person might. Boo's transition from the basement to back home was nebulous in Jim's memory. Miss Stephanie Crawford said that some of the town council told Mr. Radley that if he didn't take Boo back, Boo would die of mold from the damp. Besides, Boo could not live forever on the bounty of the county. Nobody knew what form of intimidation Mr. Radley employed to keep Boo out of sight, but Jim figured Mr. Radley kept him chained to the bed most of the time. 
Atticus said no, it wasn't that sort of thing. There were other ways of making people into ghosts. My memory came alive to see Mrs. Radley occasionally open the front door, walk to the edge of the porch, and pour water on her canis. But every day, Jim and I would see Mr. Radley walking to and from town. He was a thin, leathery man with colorless eyes, so colorless they did not reflect light. His cheekbones were sharp and his mouth was wide, with a thin upper lip and a full lower lip. Miss Stephanie Crawford said he was so upright he took the word of God as his only law, and we believed her because Mr. Radley's posture was ramrod straight. He never spoke to us. When he passed, we would look at the ground and say, Good morning, sir, and he would cough and reply. Mr. Radley's elder son lived in Pensacola. He came home at Christmas, and he was one of the few persons we ever saw enter or leave the place. From the day Mr. Radley took Arthur home, people said the house died. But there came a day when Atticus told us he'd wear us out if we made any noise in the yard and commissioned Calpurnia to serve in his absence if she heard a sound out of us. Mr. Radley was dying. He took his time about it. Wooden saw horses blocked the road at each end of the Radley lot. Straw was put down on the sidewalk. Traffic was diverted to the back street. Dr. Reynolds parked his car in front of our house and walked to the Radleys every time he called. Jim and I crept around the yard for days. At last, the saw horses were taken away, and we stood watching from the front porch when Mr. Radley made his final journey past our house. There goes the meanest man I've a god blew breath into, murmured Calpurnia, as she spat meditatively into our yard. We looked at her in surprise, for Calpurnia rarely commented on the ways of white people. The neighborhood thought when Mr. Radley went under, Boo would come out, but it had another thing coming. Boo's elder brother returned from Pensacola and took Mr. Radley's place. The only difference between him and his father was their ages. Jim said Mr. Nathan Radley bought cotton too. Mr. Nathan would speak to us, however, when we said good morning. And sometimes we saw him coming from town with a magazine in his hand. The more we told Dill about the Radleys, the more he wanted to know. The longer he would stand hugging the light pole in the corner, and the more he would wonder. Wonder what he does in there, he would murmur. Looks like he just stick his head out the door. Jim said, he goes out all right, and it's pitch dark. Miss Stephanie Crawford said she woke up in the middle of the night one time and saw him looking straight through the window at her. Said his head was like a skull looking at her. Ain't you ever waked up at night and heard him, Dill? He walks like this. Jim slid his feet through the gravel. Why do you think Miss Rachel locks up so tight at night? I've seen his tracks in our backyard many a morning, and one night I heard him scratching on the back door, but he was gone time Atticus got there. I wonder what he looks like, said Dill. Jim gave a reasonable description of Boo. Boo was about six and a half feet tall, judging from his tracks. He dined on raw squirrels and any cats he could catch. That's why his hands were blood-stained. If you ate an animal raw, you could never wash the blood off. There was a long, jagged scar that ran across his face. What teeth he had were yellow and rotten. His eyes popped and he drooled most of the time. Let's try to make him come out, said Dill. I'd like to see what he looks like. Jim said if Dill wanted to get himself killed, all he had to do was go up and knock on the front door. Our first raid came to pass only because Dill bet Jim, the gray ghost, against two Tom Swifts that Jim wouldn't get any further than the Radley Gate. In all his life, Jim had never declined a dare. Jim thought about it for three days. I supposed he loved honor more than his head, for Dill wore him down easily. You're scared, Dill said the first day. I ain't scared, just respectful, Jim said. The next day, Dill said, You're too scared to even put your big toe in the front yard. Jim said he reckoned he wasn't. He'd pass by the Radley place every school day of his life. Always running, I said. But Dill got him the third day, when he told Jim that folks in Meridian certainly weren't as afraid as the folks in Maycomb, and he'd never seen such scary folks as the ones in Maycomb. This was enough to make Jim march to the corner, where he stopped and leaned against the light pole, watching the gate hanging crazily on its homemade hinge. I hope you've got it through your head that he'll kill each and every one of us, Dill Harris, said Jim when we joined him. Don't blame me when he gouges your eyes out. You started it, remember? You're still scared, murmured Dill patiently. Jim wanted Dill to know once and for all that he wasn't scared of anything. It's just that I can't think of a way to make him come out without him getting us. 
Besides, Jim had his little sister to think of. When he said that, I knew he was afraid. Jim had his little sister to think of the time I dared him to jump off the top of the house. If I got killed, who would become of you? He asked. And then he jumped, landing unhurt, and his sense of responsibility left him until confronted by the Radley place. You gonna run out on a dare? Asked Dill. If you are, then... Dill, you have to think about these things, Jim said. Let me think a minute. It's sort of like making a turtle come out. How's that? Asked Dill. Struck a match under him. I told Jim if he set fire to the Radley house, I was going to tell Atticus on him. Dill said striking a match under a turtle was hateful. I ain't hateful. Just persuades him. It's not like you'd chunk him into the fire, Jim growled. How do you know a match don't hurt him? Turtles can't feel stupid, said Jim. Were you ever a turtle, huh? My stars, Dill. Now let me think. Reckon we can rock him. Jim stood in thought so long that Dill made a mild concession. I won't say you ran out on a dare, and I'll swap you the gray ghost if you just go up and touch the house. Jim brightened. Touch the house? That's all? Dill nodded. You sure that's all now? I don't want you hollering something different the minute I get back. Yeah, that's all, said Dill. He'll probably come out after you when he sees you in the yard, and the scout and me will jump on him and hold him down until we can tell him that we ain't going to hurt him. We left the corner, crossed the side street that ran in front of the Radley house, and stopped at the gate. Well, go on, said Dill. Scout and me's right behind you. I'm going, said Jim. Don't hurry me. He walked to the corner of the lot, then back again, studying the simple terrain as if deciding how to best affect an entry, frowning and scratching his head. And then I sneered at him. Jim threw open the gate and sped to the side of the house, slapped it with his palm and ran back to us, not wanting to see if his foray was successful. All right, so I think this is probably going to be the last vocab word of this chapter, so let's get that one down. Foray. Sudden attack or incursion into enemy territory. A raid. So let's add this in right here. Bill and I followed on his heels. Safely on our porch, panting and out of breath, we looked back. The old house was still the same, droopy and sick. But as we stared down the street, we thought we saw an invisible shutter move. Flick. A tiny, almost invisible movement, and the house was still. All right, we'll end chapter one there.